everybody. Uh, welcome. I'm trying to find the right, the best place to say it. Welcome, everybody, to the Westminster Town Hall Forum. My name is Tane Danger. I'm director of the forum. Very excited to have you all here. We have a wonderful presentation today by world-renowned economist K. Yu Jin, uh, which is going to start in a little bit. But we are going to open with some music. Uh, Gao Hong, who has been at the forum before. We're very excited to have her back. Yes. She she has performed all over the world in solo concerts with symphony orchestras, with artists from many different musical genres. She has won a Sorrel Medallion in recording, a Sally Award, six gold medals from the Global Music Awards, and numerous commissions with various musical organizations. Uh, she studied at Beijing Central Conservatory and now teaches at Carleton College. And I bring that up because she brought several of her students with her here, her today her here today, and uh, I actually wanted to just have each of them introduce themselves and what they're playing today. So hi, hello. Hello, my name is yes, Emma, and I play the Hulusu, which is this instrument. Very cool, thank you very much, and you are? Hi, my name is Amy, and I play the deeds or the bamboo flute. Very cool, and, oh great, you got a mic, perfect. Hi, my name is Eden, and I play the Chinese Gujin, also known as Chinese zither. All right, well, this is fantastic. We're going to learn more about these different instruments and the pieces that we'll hear. But for now, one more time, please, a round of applause uh, for this amazing ensemble. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so, so much for having us. And it's such a great honor to be here uh, to share with the amazing uh, Professor Jing lecture, so we're very honored to be here. The first piece we're going to play is called uh, uh, Yu Ge, which means fisherman song. It's, um, Emma is going to play Hulu Si, it's made of gourd. It's from, uh, this music is from uh, Yunnan province. It's a uh, very soothing music. I hope you like it.
Beautiful job, Emma. The next one, Eden is going to play the guzheng. Guzheng is a 21 string uh, Chinese zither. Um, she's going to play it called Jasmine Flower. Uh, 茉莉芬芳. Enjoy. Thank you, Eden. It was beautiful. Thank you. So now, yeah, give her a big class. Yeah.
Yeah. So now we're going to introduce the Chinese bamboo flute. This is a, a flute made of bamboo, and Amy is going to play a piece called the Yin Zhong Niao, which means the bird singing in the woods. You can hear all kind of birds. Now let's enjoy. Beautiful job, Amy, so beautiful. Isn't that what sounds like a bird there, right? Many birds there. Good job. 
So the next one, I will introduce the Chinese people. I think I see some of my good friends here, old friends, many Chinese friends has been knowing for 30 years being here. I've been here for 30 years. Okay, raise your hand. You haven't seen the people before in person. Wow. I'm very proud of Minnesota. Usually when I ask people how many people, oh, like a hundred percent everybody never see that. But I, I'm so um, honored to be here to represent the people. If you already know and bear with me, um, because I have this uh, story. 30 years ago I came to this country. I had a tour in 10 cities, uh, including New York City, Cleveland, Pittsburgh. When I was in Denver, then they were announcing, please come to see the Chinese woman play the pipa. After five minutes, somebody called the presenter. How could this Chinese woman play the pipa? They thought I was play the vegetable. <laughs> I wish I could. That way I could, I would be a very rich. I can know how to play it. Uh, since then, I have been. Doesn't matter where I go. I go to uh, elementary kid, elementary school, or I go play with the symphony orchestra. I always uh, first introduce what pipa is. So now I will show you the pipa is very different from the guitar. So since I don't have the mic with the stand, I will just yell. Hope everybody can hear me. So the pipa is plucked. Not like the guitar. When you play guitar, you plug the inside like this, right? So I will show you. That's how you play the guitar. My good friend, <laughs> she knows that. So when you see that, when you play the guitar, you do like this. But the Chinese people play upside away. You plug towards outside. Can we everybody try how to play the pipa? Start the index finger. You flip out. Index finger, middle finger, ring finger, pinky and thumb like this. One, two, three, four, five. 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 That's how you play the pipa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Chinese music always tell you a story. I can imitate the sound of like a flowing water. Or I can make a sound like a bubbly water. Or I can make a sound like a Chinese gong, die, die, die. Chinese simple dong, dong, dong. I mean cha, 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 do, drum, dong, dong, dong. All sounds together like a percussion band. Did you hear dai, 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 dai? Or I can make a fireworks, fire quack, or cannon shot, or blow wind. Or horse trotting. Listen carefully, I will play the horse trotting and the melody at the same time. Did you hear the horse shouting? Yeah, thank you. At this time, we hear so many geese in our backyard, so Chinese people always like to imitate the nature. Now I will try to the geese, trying to talk to each other. Or 
like he imitated the Chinese people talking. 你好吗？很高兴见到你。How are you? Nice to meet you. 很高兴见到你。Then I just heard you laughing. Ha 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 ha. Listen, I can imitate the laughing. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Give a big pause for John. <laughs> thank you. So now I'm going to play a piece of how the Chinese music combining with the song and the uh, uh, song fact. So this piece called the Dragon Boat because I always introduce this piece for the people who never hear the piece. Because in the beginning, you can hear the drum, drum, chang, drum, chang, dong, chang, dong, chang, sounds like this. See, you can hear that, and you can hear fire crack. Then you can hear the water behind the boat, sounds like this. You can hear percussion band because it, on the boats, not just uh, who can get there first, they also competing um, to keep the beat together. So they have a percussion band. Then you can hear two melodies, three melodies, or four melody each from different village. One from St. Paul, one from Minneapolis, one from Northville. <laughs> so you can hear the melody as people singing. In the middle part, you can hear people cheering. 加油，加油 In Chinese, cheering. Let's go, St. Paul. Go, Minneapolis. Here sounds like one person solo. Then they follow. Everybody start screaming. Listen this. Right, then they follow that. Everybody screaming. So in the end, they're very happy go home. Here is Dragon Ball Long Chan.
I sincerely thanks everyone to be here and invited us for uh, Professor Jean's amazing talk. Thank you so much for having us, including us. So I wanted to uh, um, uh, introduce, um, not uh, last time to say, and Emma and Amy and Eden to uh, join me. So the last piece we'll go play is called uh, 快乐的, uh, so it means uh, from southern China when they celebrate, they just dance. So it's very short. It's kind of like our goodbye and have a wonderful lecture, have a wonderful day. Here is A Xi Tiao Yue. Well, thank you to these incredible musicians for offering your gifts with us today. Hello and welcome. I am Megan Gage Finn. I serve here at Westminster as Senior Associate Pastor, and it is good to be together with you today. Welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church, especially if you are newer or visiting or newer to the Forum, where West, the Westminster Town Hall Forum has had its home here in the church since 1980. We're grateful that you're here. Please take the time to enjoy the program. A after the program, to enjoy our spaces, including the gallery, where you'll find all sorts of beautiful art to enliven your spirit. There's a brand new exhibit that has just opened featuring the art and sculpture of Paul T. Granland. And of course, please meet in Westminster Hall after the program for breads and spreads and uh, further conversation. Thank you now, and would you please join me in welcoming the Forum's director, Tane Danger. Hi, hello everyone. Um, again, my name is Tane Danger. I am director of the Forum. That ring is a good reminder that now is a good time to silence your cell phones for this program that we are about to have. Um, I'm so glad that you all are here. The Westminster Forum's mission is to invite voices of conscience to address the issues of the day from an ethical perspective. And today we have someone who is absolutely fantastic to help us do that. One of the world's foremost economists and uh, experts on China, Dr. K.U. Jin. We're very glad today's program, like all town hall forums, are entirely free and open to all. If you've never been here before, as uh, Megan Gage Finn said, we've been doing this since 1980, and we do about eight to 10 programs a year. They're all like this, where you can just come and enjoy and learn uh, entirely free here in person via live stream. And that is all made possible by individual donors and supporters. So if you haven't or you are considering it, please uh, think about supporting the Town Hall Forum. I am not exaggerating when I say it is literally the only way that we can do programs like this. Uh, there's, if you're here in person, there's an envelope in your program where you can uh, put a donation or you can scan the QR code to do an online gift. Similarly, if you are watching online, uh, you can give Give at westminsterforum.org slash support. I'll also do a quick plug. We completely redid the Westminster Forum website recently uh, with a lot of help from Sandy Wolfwood, who's one of our board members, and it looks really good. So if you haven't, like, go to the Westminster Forum website one of these days, because it's great. 
Um, okay. Quickly, uh, we're going to get to today's program, but I did want to announce we have one more program this spring, and we actually haven't taught, this is the first time that we're talking about this, so uh, you all are the first audience to really hear about this in this big way. So uh, May, this May, marks four years since the murder of George Floyd, just, you know, less than a few miles from here in Minneapolis, and the uprising that followed. So in the year following that, we at the Forum started a program called the Arc Towards Justice, where we invited a national voice on racial justice to come and speak about where we have come in that time and where we still need to go. And we are continuing that this year for our fourth annual Arc Towards Justice program, May 23rd, Thursday, May 23rd. And our speaker this year is Wesley Lowry, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and the author of the book American White Lash, A Changing Nation and the Cost of Progress. That book tells the story of how the election of the nation's first black president ignited a new and frightening phase in a historical cycle of racial progress followed by backlash. Uh, it has been called one of the best books of the year by National Public Radio. It was a New York Times bestseller, and Ibram X. Kendi talked about it as being an indispensable reading. So we really hope you'll join us for our fourth annual Arc Towards Justice with Wesley Lowry, Thursday, May 23rd. All right. Our thanks today to M.A. Mortensen Companies for co-sponsoring our entire spring season here at the Forum. Uh, we are very grateful for their generous support of what we do. Thanks as well to our media co-sponsors, and we have several of them, and you saw a lot of them if you're here in the, in the hall. They're great. So our longtime partners at Minnesota Public Radio, who record and broadcast all of the Westminster Town Hall forums. Uh, in fact, all of this spring's Westminster forums are going to be broadcast uh, on Minnesota Public Radio over the noon hour, one each day the last week of May. So if you missed any of our programs, want to hear them again, invite someone else to listen, mark that last week in May as you will be able to hear those broadcasts statewide and anywhere in the world uh, on NPR. Thanks as well to MinPost, a nonprofit community supported newsroom. You can see their coverage of critical issues, challenges, and opportunities facing Minnesota at minpost.com. They are also outside, so go say hello to them uh, after the program. And to Sahan Journal, whose mission is to provide reliable, high quality journalism for immigrants and communities of color in Minnesota. You can learn more about them at sahanjournal.com and again, visit them out in the lobby. Okay, uh, one other uh, short note. We, uh, we have a program right after we're done here today. If you are inspired, you are thinking a lot, as I am guessing you will be, because our speaker is amazing, uh, we are going to have an opportunity for you to continue this conversation immediately following the program. So our friends from Global Minnesota are here, and they are actually going to facilitate a post-forum small group discussions in the MISL room. You don't need to sign up ahead of time. You don't need to register. You can just... Uh, go out to the MISL room, which is sort of straight back this way. Uh, there'll be signs pointing you in the right direction. And join some of the other attendees in discussing what we've heard for, uh, today. Also following the program, copies uh, of Dr. Jin's book uh, are going to be for sale from Next Chapter Books right outside. And so again, grab a copy of the book, and she's going to be signing those uh, right afterwards. So uh, last thing. If you're here, there are cards in your program, and those are what we use for you to ask questions. So if you want to ask a question, if you're inspired at any point, write it down on the card in front of you, and during the sort of halfway point, our ushers will come around and pick those up, and the second half of the program is all your questions for Dr. Jin. So with that, I am going to introduce our speaker. So one more time. This is the Westminster Town Hall Forum. My name is Tane Danger, and our speaker today is Dr. Kayu Jin. She is a tenured professor of economics at the London School of Economics and Political Science. She was born and raised in Beijing and attended high school and college in the United States. She holds a BA, an MA, and a PhD in economics, all from Harvard University. Her most recent book is 
the new China playbook beyond socialism and capitalism, which is going to inform much of what we'll hear from her about today. Dr. Jin is an academic member of the China Finance 40 Group and has worked with the World Bank, the IMF, the China Banking Regulatory Commission, and more. She's a non-executive board member of the conglomerate Richmond, and she resides with her family for part of the year in London and part of the year in Beijing. We are so glad to have her here, and I hope you will join me in doing a big warm welcome to the Westminster Forum for Dr. K.U. Jin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am so happy and so thrilled to be, to be here. In 1997, I moved to America. I was 14. I was alone. Um, I arrived at the doorsteps of an American family who actually took me in. They thought I was only staying for a week during an exchange program, and I stayed for three years. Um, just months before I arrived, I was a proud member of the Party Youth League in China. I was studying Marxist economic and political thought in school, and it never occurred to me, nor to my friends, that there was something called fun plans on a Friday night. And of course, that all changed when I got here to this country. I was genuinely mesmerized by the openness um, by the free thinking, and I was a little shocked to be encouraged by my history teacher to question authority. Textbooks, teacher, and even facts. Ooh, what a foreign concept. Um, and I was surprised to learn that in school life there was something actually more important than grades. And the China I knew from back home, exuberant, dynamic, ever-changing so fast, was so different from the China that uh, Americans had in mind when they asked me questions when I got there, as if it was kind of a dark place of terror. And that contrast in perspective really stuck with me ever since. Now, thinking back, this little story of mine, I think really embodies a lot of the differences, um, the misunderstandings, potentially the cultural gaps that we have between the two countries, US and China, and that's why I wanted to share it with you today. Now, I wrote this book that was published last year, The New China Playbook, and trying to explain how China actually works, how it has come to foster a really unique model uh, that goes beyond conventional socialism or capitalism, and also how China has a new generation of Chinese radically different from the older generations, and they're gonna change the face of China. So my goal was to hopefully give a perspective from the inside, based on data, facts, and a huge amount of wonderful, serious scholarly works that has been done on the Chinese economy by international scholars over the years. And most of all, rise above the emotions and sensationalism and the news cycle. And so I wanted to tell a different side of the story, and there is always a different side of the story. And given how tense things have become between the two countries, US and China, I think it is important to tell that story. Uh, so allow me to offer you a different perspective and lens to look through uh, in the next hour. So people ask me often, what are the biggest misunderstandings about China? Now one of it is actually how the model works. Now 30 million private companies sprung out from nowhere like mushrooms spring up from a desert in so little time, 20 years. Uh, in the beginning stages and beginning ages of the 1980s, it was, China was a thoroughly anti-capitalistic uh, uh, economy and suddenly 30 million out of nowhere. We tend to think of China's system as being extremely centralized, as if everything is, decisions are made on the top by a few people, maybe even one person, but that's not quite accurate. Politically, it's very centralized, but economically, it's extremely decentralized. Decisions, implementation, um, uh, are all made on the ground, decided by local officials, who actually go about helping private entrepreneurs to succeed. 
In my book, I call this the mayor economy. Local provincial leaders, I mean, they could be mayors, they could be party uh, uh, secretaries, in charge of turning backward fishing villages into global technology hubs, like Shenzhen. And that's what they did. I don't know what we expect our mayors to do for us in this country, but in China, that was their mandate. It was to help growth, it was to implement these radical reforms, it was to help protect the environment, to, to really encourage the private entrepreneurs to build um, uh, something uh, new. And so currently, even fast forward many years, today, they're running around all over the country, uh, all over the country building mini Silicon Valleys, helping private entrepreneurs find talent, coordinate financing, build a whole industrial clutter around key companies like EVs or semiconductors. The Shanghainese government actually gave money and cheap land to Tesla, hoping that they would build factories and sell um, cars there. Chinese local governments giving, subsidizing American companies in China. People were fine with that. They liked it. They bought Tesla cars. They're all over the streets of China today. And so a lot of people don't understand what, what are the incentives behind these mayors, you know, the decentralized economy, that they would want to do this uh, for the private entrepreneurs and help the economy. Well, that comes back to some pretty unique institutional features in China. So to be promoted to the higher runs of the political hierarchy, and everybody wanted to be promoted, um, you needed to do a good job for the local economy. And on top of that, by doing that, you got more jobs filled your fiscal coffers, um, and the land you own, which the local governments own, are actually worth more. And most of all, you needed the private entrepreneurs to help you. Right? We usually think about China as if the state kind of suppresses the private or surprises. No, actually, it's quite the opposite. They need the private entrepreneurs because they're the most productive and they're the most innovative. So there were huge incentives. And on top of that, there was a lot of competition across the regions in China. It was like a beauty contest, you know, contesting for the best and promising entrepreneurs, and you had to be friendly to them. You had to be nice to them. You had to be helpful. So in the data, we see that the cleanest, friendliest uh, local governments saw the fastest growth and the rise of the largest companies. And those that were more corrupt, more extractive, they lost out. So there's an incentive to behave, to actually lend a helping hand rather than a grabbing hand, which some might expect in a country with a poor rule of law or too much political power concentrated in the hands of too few would have been uh, very difficult. But that was uh, what the mayors did. And you didn't need every mayor to be like that. You know, China's a big country. There are tens of thousands of local governments, and many of them were corrupt, and money went into their pockets, but the majority were incentivized, and that was enough to lead to this seismic change at breakneck uh, pace. Now, leaving aside what we think about China and their problems, their challenges, the challenges with the model, we're seeing the economy slow down at a significant pace today. Uh, it is still a fact that it is the country that has been growing the fastest for the longest period of time in all of human history. And that is a fact. So something has must have gone right. Now, this comes to a broader point and a more contested point, which is, what do we actually think about the role of the state? Now, I'm a Western-trained economist. I can tell you in our models, and in our intellectual thinking framework, there's very little room for the state, except for maybe regulations, maybe stepping in when there are market failures. But I can also understand culturally and historically why we feel so uneasy about state interventions. And we've also seen the state overreaching and being too heavy handed, of course, and these are problems. But sitting around many of these meetings with politicians, leaders, experts, talking about development and developing countries, a perennial thing that comes up is not enough state capacity. Emerging markets need to double their infrastructure in the next few years not enough state coordination, not enough uh, investment. That's a fact as well. And China didn't have that problem. China actually had the opposite problem, too much infrastructure, which was also wasteful, it was inefficient, but it was still a better problem to have 
than to not have enough connectivity to unleash people's productivity on balance. Now, for all of its expedience, the model has serious challenges. It's being tested. It's much less effective now. Growth is slowing down. Huge amounts of debt. 140 million vacant homes to be filled in who knows how many years. There's too much capacity, too much supply, not enough demand. The financial system is really a living dinosaur. Too little credit for the small and medium-sized enterprises. And that's the other side of this high growth, high cost model. It was costly. There were waste. But to the Chinese, on net, the benefits still outweighed the cost because a billion people were lifted out of poverty. And even today, it's the first time that you have a developing country being able to do things like cutting edge technology. And despite the problems, and I'm sure there'll be many questions about Chinese economies today, and I'll share with you my muse, I still think it's too early to write China off. This country, this very country, the US, we've had 12 recessions in the last century. It took more than 10 years to recover from the Great Recession of 2009. China is currently experiencing its first serious economic recession uh, in the last 40 years. The potential is still there. There's a vast majority of people underemployed, undereducated in the rural areas. And even just between China, where China is today, and its potential, whether it's in terms of urbanization, tertiary education, the service sector, productivity, there's a big gap still yet to be filled. And again, even in this country, we've seen over time that poor states converged to the richer states. It's in the data, and it's also going to happen to China. So there's still room for growth. Now, the second misunderstanding is about Chinese aspirations. Some in this country may think that China's sole goal is to overtake the US. Geez, that's a lot of responsibilities in the world. No thank you. Um, and no, not feasible. The daily preoccupation of the vast majority of Chinese today is still about putting food on their table and keeping their kids in school, not really having a dangerous obsession about America, really. It doesn't believe that worrying about America is actually going to solve its own problems, and the government needs to keep its own house in order. There's a lot of domestic challenges. And by the way, talking about aspirations, and we have an ethical theme in this uh, series of talks, we're going to have to accept that there will be similar aspirations from India, Indonesia, Vietnam, the entire African continent. They are rising. They have huge aspirations to peddle their way to prosperity. And we'll have to need to deal with that too. They're going to start selling cheap goods to China, use its technology. And by the way, some of that is already happening as factories are moving to Southeast Asia en masse. The Chinese don't really have much time to talk about the Vietnamese stealing their jobs. We don't really hear about it in the newspapers. Instead, what they hear about is they should invest more in smart manufacturing, in uptooling, upskilling uh, their workers, climbing up the value chain so they're not forever stuck and condemned to producing cheap goods. Climbing up the global value chain is what they're focused on. And maybe it's also another cultural thing to do. And again, culture and history is something, it's a theme in my book. I like to talk about it a little bit because I do think we kind of sometimes underestimate how important uh, they are, and that contributes to some of the misunderstandings. Um, but it's a cultural thing to do in China to turn a crisis into motivation. Now, speaking of President Biden's export controls on uh, semiconductors or you know, kind of asking companies to break off uh, ties with China or to stop selling to them, well, initially it didn't go down that well uh, in, in China. Um, but then they kind of just turned it into a positive attitude. It totally mobilized everybody. They whipped companies into shape. 
For the longest time, they were actually comfortably importing American uh, chips, and now all of a sudden they have to start buying Chinese chips. And not because the Chinese government forced them to, but rather it's because of um, these policies from America. So, and in fact, they said, well, thank you, thank you for keeping us on our toes. There were huge accelerations in these domestic industries, and there was almost a national euphoria when they made breakthroughs in the chip industry. Small victories, but still small triumphs, and the P Chinese people were pretty happy. They turned this around and said, oh, this is pretty positive. And by the way, President Biden, would you mind also sanctioning our national men's soccer team too? <laughs> but thank you. Jokes aside, um, to look at to the rise of Africa and India, does China want to see that as a threat or opportunity? I actually really think they see it as an opportunity. And that rest of the world is, is coming. 90% of the people in the world still live in the developing countries, and they too have that kind of aspirations. Um, and third, finally, the Chinese people, the misunderstandings, and the new generation. That's actually what I enjoy talking about the most. Uh, it's what gives me the most hope that we are going to do much better with a new generation and that we're not actually headed on a collision course. The new generation, born after the one-child policy in the 1980s, I was among the first generation. I have lots of thoughts about it. I've done lots of research about it. Um, it's a fascinating topic. Uh, they are radically different from my parents' age, you know, going through huge vicissitudes, economic, psychological hardships in China during these turbulent times. Um, the new generation, they love leisure, consuming, spending, money on clothes, uh, traveling, entertainment, all of that. They even like to borrow to spend. We used to think about China as a big saver, you know, saving so much and then flooding the world with capital and products. Well, this generation is different. They borrow, they spend. 85% of the consumer credit is actually accounted for by people under 35. One click on Alibaba's you know, e-commerce website, you can borrow to buy lipstick. That's what college students do. I don't know who, who pays them back, maybe their parents, but anyway, they, they still love to, to borrow. The, the mentality uh, has totally shifted. And despite what we think about the one-child policy, the dark sides, there were also some unintended consequences. For one, it seriously raised the status of Chinese women. Why? Because you used to educate your sons first before your daughters, and everybody now with a daughter pour all the resources into her, the modern Mulans of every family. Right? And we see in the data that the gender gap completely closed in my generation for uh, attainment in higher education. And in the data, among the business leaders, those born in the 1990s, 45% of the business leaders are women, compared to only 6% of those born in the 1970s, 60s, sorry, or 10% for those born in the 1970s. So it really accelerated the closing of the gender gap for China in this formerly very traditional Confucian society, way above what economic growth would have predicted. Uh, in, uh, uh, in, in other countries. And moreover, this is a really open-minded generation. I've looked at lots of international surveys about them. Uh, they care about things like diversity, animal rights, um, social inequity. They feel more confident. Uh, you know, the, the kind of factory workers that opted for three uh, shifts a night back in those days, that's not in their generation. They're more relaxed more chill, you know, it's not a bad thing. Um, they're not gonna be working as hard, as tenacious, but they have a broader, you know, perspective about life uh, in general. And also they communicate better. Many of them have been educated in this country. A third of international students in this country are Chinese students. And five million visitors before the pandemic come to this country. They are fluent with the Western culture, the language, uh, and they would be great ambassadors uh, for uh, China, and they connect much better with the Zen Z Gen Zs around the world, and they are that bridge. Um, and they're also very innovative. Now, this is again a fact, despite what's happening between the two countries, 
I don't know if you noticed, but four out of the five of the most downloaded apps today are actually Chinese. I don't know if it will stay, the stay, stay this way, but you know, the new generation, they have much more, they have much less of a cultural divide and gap. And so let me leave with this thought. Our great leader, Deng Xiaoping, who really pushed the country for reforms and opening up and really was um, the forefather of this miracle success, used to say about intractable problems, and we had many back in those days as well, let's leave it to the smarter, younger generation to figure it out. They're gonna, they're gonna sort it out. <laughs> but at the same time, we still need to hold the world together for them to actually give them that chance. Um, I don't think that on top of all the debt that we're gonna throw at them, or the dirtier planet, that we really want to add a more dangerous world on the cusp of uh, collapse uh, to the mix. So it's where places like this, forums like this, to offer this exchange, uh, to get to know each better, each other better, to uh, reduce these misgivings that I think is so, so important. And it's really in this kind of country that such curiosity and openness for different views can actually take place. So I really thank you uh, for listening. Thank you for giving me this uh, opportunity and thank you for giving me and so many other students from China, from India, from Africa to learn from this country. And we can also expect that when the next global financial crisis comes around the corner, and I'm certainly sure it will, the two central banks in US and China, they're gonna have to call each other up, right? <laughs> that if there's ever a hope of realizing the green transition, we are going to need the cheapest, cleanest energy and technology and a whole lot of investment and collaboration uh, to make it happen. And everybody here is here to stay. Nobody is really going anywhere. Uh, we're here. So let's keep the people-to-people -people connection, keep the dialogues open, have some goodwill, and maybe even just start from small victories. And I believe over time, even more can be achieved. Thank you. Thank you so much. Doctor, uh, oh. Thank you so much. This is the Westminster Town Hall Forum coming to you from Westminster Presbyterian Church in downtown Minneapolis, Minnesota. My name is Tane Danger. Our guest this afternoon is economist Dr. Kei Jin. She is the author of The New China Playbook Beyond Socialism and Capitalism. This is the part of the program, a lot of enthusiasm for the book. Uh, this is the part of the program where we open it up for you all to ask questions. Uh, if you're here in the room, you've got uh, cards in your, you've got a card in your program to write your question down and hand it forward. Uh, and you can hold it up and ushers will come around and grab your cards and we will uh, bring those to our table over here and we'll bring as many of them as we can. Uh, while folks are starting to do that, write your questions and we'll collect them. Uh, I'm I'm going to take a minute to say thank you uh, to some of our sponsors who made this program and many of others happen. Thanks, as I said at the top, to Mortensen Companies for sponsoring our entire spring season. Thanks to our longtime media partners, Minnesota Public Radio, for recording and broadcasting all Westminster Town Hall forums. Thanks as well to MinPost, a nonprofit community supported newsroom. You can see their coverage of critical issues and challenges and opportunities facing Minnesota at MinPost.com. Thanks as well to Sahan Journal. Their mission is to provide reliable, high quality journalism for immigrants and communities of color in Minnesota. Learn more about them at SahanJournal.com. Now, as I promised at the top, Dr. Jin will be signing copies of the New China Playbook immediately after the program. Those are for sale from Next Chapter Books in the lobby, so please uh, join us back out there. We will also have our traditional breads and spreads over in Westminster Hall, which you're invited to. And if you want to continue the conversation, there is a moderated program uh, with Global Minnesota in the Meisel Room, and you can join other attendees and having a small group where you talk more about what we've heard today and uh, reflect and converse about that. So 
With that, I see people waving cards. We're already starting to collect some cards up here. So I am going to welcome back to the podium uh, Dr. Jin and start bringing the questions from the audience. So come on up. Oh, thank you. Perfect. All right. So. So you, you started to allude to this a little bit in your remarks, but the book came out last year. A lot has happened in the last year in uh, the world and in the Chinese economy in particular. We have a real estate sort of uh, crisis, I think it's fair to say, in China that's been happening. Uh, there's been a lot of questions about the slowdown in uh, growth, and there have been some numbers that came out this week that suggest that some of that maybe is coming back. But I guess maybe just a way to frame this is, if you were to write one more chapter of the book today, reflecting on sort of what's been happening over the last year or so since the book came out, uh, what would you say about the model and how it is holding up now and maybe how it has to change going forward? Thank you, Tane, and that's, that's a really excellent question, really important question. The model is being tested. Uh, in my book, I really argue that state coordination, state mobilization was really important for a certain stage of development. China has reached the stage of development where there needs to be a lot more markets and a lot less state. And so that has to change, but there's some signs that things are uh, changing uh, over time. But, you know, we also have to wonder, as I alluded to this as well, the ups and downs are part of the features of, you know, economic cycles. And one big difference is that this country had something like a $5 trillion stimulus package over the pandemic. Chinese households had nothing and there is you know, a serious uh, loss of confidence and also loss of opportunities, so it's gonna take time for the economy to recover. And by the way, China's already massive. It's already big, so to keep on growing that fast is gonna be very difficult. India, everybody talks about India, and India is definitely an exciting place, but even if India grows, let's say, four to five percentage points faster than China until 2030, China's still gonna contribute $130 trillion more of GDP to the world uh, than India. So it has to have a, a slow down anyways. But look, you know, I think a broader question is, can we have more expertise in the system? Can the people's preferences be uh, 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 reflected more in the leadership's uh, decisions? That all requires a huge amount of reforms. I'm worried, what I'm worried about most is when countries get to a certain uh, income level and they drop the pro-growth agenda. And that would be really, really sad for China and for the rest of the world too. Um, there's a question here about uh, China potentially trying to, a strategy to uh, take the place uh, or at least compete with the U.S. as the world's uh, monetary exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, this could probably get very technical, but I'm wondering if you can help kind of orient us around what that space is in that conversation. Um, China has, among its other ambitions or aspirations, um, wants to internationalize the RMB. You know, dollar is very powerful. Dollar is very, very dominant. Uh, and so I think it has the plans, but realistically, it is still very, very far from coming close to that goal of being even really an international currency. Why? Very, very simply and very briefly, you need a financial system like the U.S. Breadth, liquidity, size. Just look at the U.S. treasuries. It's not just trade denominated in dollars, but the lending is also denominated in dollars. And it's very, very hard to um, replace that. But that said, again, we cannot forget the other part of the world, the massive emerging developing world. They have a desire for a parallel movement of maybe a common currency, maybe an alternative to dollar, albeit being very difficult. That is a desire in the financial system, but it's also very difficult to achieve. Uh, there, there's a couple of different questions about uh, Hong Kong and about uh, Hong Kong's ability to, to self-determine, but also uh, at least one about uh, Hong Kong as a global financial center and whether that uh, changes as uh, it is sort of, it's in a different world now where it's uh, become part of mainland China in this way. So I'm wondering if you can talk about both of those, both uh, sort of uh, the relationship that we've seen over the last years with China and Hong Kong, and then also the financial sort of center implications of that. 
The fate of Hong Kong and mainland China are inextricably linked. Uh, if Hong Kong does well, it makes China look good. And if China's economy does well, it would make uh, it would be good for Hong Kong's economy because Hong Kong is the financial center, the conduit through which a lot of the capital investment flows. And so I recently uh, went to Hong Kong last week, uh, two weeks ago, and they were still pretty optimistic because even though a lot of people left, some new people are coming back and they're reinventing themselves. I, I'm not an expert on Hong Kong, but I do just want to mention one thing. And in the spirit of just giving you another side of the story, because we're all familiar with one, one side of the story, um, the, the Hong Kong people told me that in 2003, SARS arrived in Hong Kong and the Hong Kong economy was completely you know, going under. At that time, Hong Kong asked mainland China, can you lift the restrictions so that you can help us with our economy? They actually took the initiative uh, so that there could be more economic integration between the, the two countries. Many of you have been to Hong Kong. Most people from most countries will never need a visa to go to Hong Kong. Guess who needs a visa? Chinese. Mainland Chinese need to go get a visa. And um, just in the spirit of a broader audience, the cultural aspects. I, they, they've cut up, they put up two beautiful museums. And geez, the artists, politically opposite to Chinese government, are all hanging there. I was very, very surprised. So I think the, the complexity of the issue is not something I have the expertise or the time to talk about. But anyways, they are kind of really linked together. And I still believe the Hong Kong people um, have some hope that they'll be able to kind of reinvigorate their economy and their livelihoods. Uh, there's a question here that uh, ties together to, so you talked about the younger generation, uh, and this person is wondering what this younger generation thinks of the Belt and Road uh, initiatives, uh, and that will probably require a little bit of explanation as to the Belt and Road initiatives. Thank you. China also had a vision, or you know, can say the leadership had a vision in China of building infrastructure around the world. And as we mentioned, emerging markets need infrastructure. There's a one trillion dollar infrastructure gap every year in the world. And you know, I just came from the World Bank. They were talking about we need infrastructure investment. But so China came up with this Belt and Road Initiative. China wanted to put in money. They wanted to send construction workers. They wanted to do these development projects. Um, that was a good idea in design. It was probably not well implemented, huge amount of problems, uh, emerging market debt. But there's also a lot of misunderstanding, and that is also changing. By the way, just one statistic, 90% of the developing country's debt is held by Western financial institutions. And that's just the data. It's not really just the Chinese um, infrastructure that has uh, 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 kind of cast them in, into debt. So I have issues. I have issues with, with the plan and implementation, but it was um, an idea. I don't know what the younger generation uh, thinks about it. The younger generation, obviously, uber-connected. They think about innovation. They don't think about hard power as much. That's the older generation, you know, the infrastructure, the money, and all this hard politics. They think about softer links and softer power, and that's also why I, I'm more hopeful for them. I mean, I think it's fair to say that there is a growing skepticism or, or in certain parts, in certain sectors of this country, in the United States, of uh, going out into the globe and trying to uh, set terms for other countries, right? Like, and, and we have a long history of doing that, but you hear a lot more of people saying, is that really our role? And I guess maybe that's part of the question. Do you hear those kinds of debates right now in China about like, what is our role, not just in how we take care of ourselves, but what values do we potentially like impose or ask of other countries that we work with? That is a really, really great question. Thank you, Tane, for that. I, it is, you know, reminds me to say that People in China talk about really different issues, and they, they worry about different issues, partly because you know, they're still, they have you know, developing country, have different set of challenges. Um, they want to stay engaged. I think it would be a mistake to think about China as wanting to kind of recede from the globe. They want to be, you know, it's all about openness and sending their kids to school internationally, and if they can, merging the businesses. And by the way, Starbucks, 
everywhere. You know, I said, <laughs> yes, McDonald's, that was my a gift when I did well in school, a Happy Meal. Um, uh, uh, that was luxury, luxury and, um, you know, Estee Lauder. I think American business have, or potentially can do really well in China, and they, they like that. They like to be internationally integrated. Now, just to be serious for a little bit and to be completely honest, I do think that Chinese government feels somewhat of an existential threat um, of not being able to control their core components like chips or um, uh, uh, core competencies. And in that sense, they're trying to strive for greater independence. As, by the way, Japan is spending $500 million on indigenous uh, uh, innovation. We haven't talked about the CHIPS Act, Science Act, Inflation Reduction Act. Europe is doing the same. UK is feeling it's you know, falling behind and spending a lot more on compute. So we're, we're getting that kind of you know, a return of, you know, more needs to be done. And I'm not sure it's all that bad because if it does mean lots more cleaner energy and a faster transition, um, it has to be managed. It's a complex relationship that has to be managed, but it's not inconsistent with globalization. Maybe protection on certain areas, but more open uh, on other areas. These are not irreconcilable paradoxes. Uh, there's a question here. Can you say more about China and intellectual property and particularly the use of potentially of U.S. intellectual property? Yeah, intellectual property protection was very weak for the longest period of time. Um, and the government has really tried uh, to at least start the process of cutting down you know, theft and putting in a very comprehensive system. Why? It's not just with American companies or German companies. Chinese companies are stealing from each other. And in order to get innovation, you need to have intellectual property uh, protection. And now there are many, many things that are going into the courts. I, I've also met with, um, with lots of, you know, uh, as I mentioned, mayors, and they were talking about German multinationals in their city, and when there was an inter IP leak, how much they, you know, really tried to uh, uh, change things and, and manage things. So I think it is also um, in the process of becoming more, uh, uh, more, uh, more serious. By the way, um, maybe this is part of Confucian culture, but apparently, to Chinese, stealing books is not a crime. Um, but so they they started teaching people in middle school and elementary school, the importance of respecting other people's intellectual property. So I think they're serious, but it's gonna take some, some time uh, to make it really happen, but it's also actually good for China too. Uh, I, we have several questions uh, here about uh, Taiwan, and I, I understand you're an economist. This is an ethics-based forum, so I guess, I don't know, maybe one way to frame this is uh, trying to take a summary of a bunch of these. Is there an ethical way to think about frame China and Taiwan and the rest of the world? That, that I think, is a critical, critical question that concerns China, that concerns uh, people in this part of the world um, as well. Uh, for all of the things that we read about in headline news about this assertiveness towards Taiwan, I think there's not been enough reporting about, let's say, the premier, Chinese premier in Davos, uh, in the world, you know, facing uh, international, um, the international audience, announcing that China will not tolerate conflict and chaos in the region. And I think it's as much of a signal as the Chinese government potentially uh, can give. I really wouldn't underestimate how peace, you know, how much peace means to this generation of, of Chinese. Again, the one-child policy. You know, everybody has only one child. Uh, think about what that would mean if there was really a conflict. Um, on a more practical level, first of all, I believe that dialogue, exchange, you know, President Xi recently said, there's nothing we can't talk over, you know, between the mainland and Taiwan, talk things over on a practical level. I think that would, you know, conflict is really the very, very bottom of a long list of other options uh, to deal with this. And I can appreciate and understand uh, some of the uncertainties, and certainly for me as well, for everybody, um, it is on our mind. But I think that, you know, again, just taking a data point, this is Ta Taiwanese university, lots of citations, many different surveys. Among the Ta Taiwanese, 90% of the people prefer status quo. 5% prefer independence, and 5% prefer siding with China. 
And so I think that, you know, what I'm a little bit also worried about is a lot of these tensions, misunderstandings, miscalculations could also, you know, push things in a little bit in the wrong direction. But let's hope not. Well, isn't even though then you have to define what the status quo is, which seems like kind of part of the debate that we're having, like China has one notion of what the status quo is that in certain ways the U.S. and other parts of the world disagree with, whether Taiwan is part of mainland China or not. I think the status quo is just kind of what's going on now, implicit understanding that let's just keep us separate, and, but not, not really too separate, and, uh, and not much changing. I think that's the, yeah. So there's a related uh, question here about the, the geopolitics, um, and I promise we'll get back to some economics questions, but there, there, is a, there is a question here about how we account for China's support of Russia and North Korea, and what China's goals would be in those relationships. Again, a, a, you know, a very difficult question to, to engage with and answer. Um, again, let me just give you a different perspective, not necessarily something I personally agree or not agree, but just give you a kind of a, a, an, an angle from, from China. First of all, China shares a border with Russia. Any country that shares a border with Russia you know, needs to manage the relationship. Um, China also doesn't see that a substantially weakened China uh, sorry, a substantially weakened Russia is good for China from a real politique point of view, you know, because of the rising tensions between U.S. and China. That triangular relationship, Russia, China, America, you know, for years, for history, throughout history, has always been short-term based. I don't believe there's a long-term commitment or real friendship, but it is very much about you know, a multipolar world, a different, different coalitions, and whether right or wrong, some Chinese believe that a stamp, substantially weakened China would mean that all the attention and focus would be uh, on China. But at the same time, it is very clear, and it's part of this five principles, that foreign invasion is not something they support. And so um, I think, on the other hand, uh, you know, the Ukrainian issue is something that they also openly acknowledge as being very difficult. But um, uh, uh, so I think it's that, that thing that they have to grapple with that I know obviously also confuses uh, other parts of the world. Okay, I promise an economics question. Uh, give it, this is a good question, I think. So given your description of China as a market-driven economy, in what ways is it still communist? <laughs> Thank you for that question. I don't really know if there is any uh, communist part of aspect of it. But you know, when I say beyond socialism and capitalism conventionally defined, I'm talking about a pretty unique balance between um, industry and state, state coordination and market mechanisms, individualism and communalism. And so China has decided that it's going to be on one part of that spectrum. Now, America might be totally, you know, on the one end of free markets. China be, might be some, somewhere in between, but there's not just one model. And so I don't think it's necessary communism, but, you know, how much of state coordination, state role, state uh, 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 intervention is allowed. And as I mentioned to you before, personally, I think that China has come to an age where it needs a lot more markets and a lot less uh, state. Um. There's a, there's a couple questions here about Xi, uh, President Xi Jinping, uh, about his extended presidential terms, about some of his uh, work in the world, and I would love for you to comment on those. And I might also ask with that, should we think about Xi Jinping's uh, economic like understanding of the world, what he's trying to do as something new and different? Is he trying to do something different as the leader of China than previous leaders have done? Are we in a different chapter under Xi Jinping? Um, certainly things feel like they have changed. Uh, and if you ask uh, you know, the younger generation, do we want a freer and more open society? I'm, I'm sure their answer would be yes. I'm sure the people would want that. But, you know, they look at Western democracies and what's been happening around the world, democracies that's been introduced to some of the native soil. Uh, you know, in all honesty, I don't think they're that convinced that that is actually the answer to some of their own problems as well. In other words, they're not also seeing 
um, that much inspiration in some of these things. But certainly the society ha has become more controlled. And um, yes, the leadership has a somewhat different agenda. Now again, not all of this is new. Uh, we, we had the same arguments here in this country, in, in Europe, about big tech, about monopolies, about you know, consumer protection of data. Um, I think that the leaderships in China, uh, they, they are skeptical of this deeply entrenched link between politics and capital. They don't think that ca politics should be singing to the tunes of capital. They think capital should be singing to the tunes of, of politics. And so invariably there is a somewhat different agenda. Uh, and, you know, while some of it is, 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 is it's, it's understandable, you know, we talked about the one-child policy generation, the parents are so anxious about the education system, the competition, and uh, all these tutorial companies. And so the leadership did something, and it wasn't great, it didn't do good for the stock market and investment, um, but it's, it's not that, uh, it's not that difficult to understand that there are things to be concerned, but my own view, you know, China can't give up the pro-growth agenda. It's way too early. These are things to be considered, to think about, but you need experts. You need to rely on experts to give you the sound counsel and advice on how to do things, how to bring about more growth and more inclusive growth. It's not just by going after companies or regulations that are erratic that's gonna deliver that, but I think the broader agenda of more equity is not uniquely a Chinese thing. Uh Switching to leaders in this country, uh, just this week, President Biden has uh, recommended that if he were reelected, he would increase steel tariffs on steel coming from China. Uh, former President Trump has offered to raise tariffs on almost everything. Uh, this is almost like an economics 101. Can you just sort of talk about tariff policy and like if those came to pass, what would happen in this country? What would happen in China? What would that actually mean? Um, there's been a lot of studies in America, serious studies that show that the last round of tariffs were paid by Americans, and that was a fact, and that increased the prices, that's going to add to inflationary pressure, but still, leaving those studies aside, and there's a really broad consensus among the economists that's been uh, the case, you know, we're going to see this because of, of a political uh, issue. You know, I think about Chinese roads, German cars, Japanese cars, American cars, the predominantly foreign cars running uh, on the streets of China. And China can now do EVs. It can't do its own combustion engine uh, vehicles, but it can do pretty good EVs, pretty cheap, pretty high quality. But they're going to meet it with a lot of resistance if they try to go into Europe. And certainly, I highly doubt they will be able to come here. So then I think about, okay, what happens if Chinese start to say, well, if you know, you're gonna slap on tariffs on EVs, shouldn't we slap on even more tariffs on the German cars and American cars? And I think this is not, we're not heading in the right direction. It's a lot of protectionism under the guise of national security, but this is you know, not the, really, the, the good direction that we, we, we should all head. So it's gonna raise some retaliatory efforts, but. The Chinese thinking is, look, you know, we're expecting this anyways. It doesn't matter if it's Trump. It doesn't matter if it's Biden. It's kind of all just going to be like that. So um, they're just going to have to keep going. It maybe they'll work with more uh, global uh, partners. And by the way, in the data, what do we see about trade? Yes, there's less direct trade between China and the U.S., but they're all going through Mexico and Vietnam. It's just taking longer, and it's more expensive. Uh, and Chinese money, you know, guess who's funding the factories in Vietnam? Chinese capital. Chinese investment in Mexico has risen eight times. It's just taking a longer route. Why? Because ultimately, the ultimate supply and demand are still coming from the two largest countries, lar largest economies in the world. And even if they try to, you know, kind of break up in direct terms, they're still deeply embedded indirectly through these links through other countries. Uh, what, one more audience question here, at least. It says, could you discuss the potential effects of uh, the Chinese demographic transition and how that might affect the Chinese economy uh, and political development over the next generation? Thank you, and that's, that's a really excellent question because people are really worried about 
China's aging. And it's because the one-child policy, people don't really want to have kids anymore. And that is seen to be as a serious challenge uh, for, for the Chinese government. My own view is there's something actually even more urgent than that. And that is the big, deep skill and education mismatch. And by the way, this is not a uniquely Chinese uh, problem as well. There have been 100 million additional college graduates in the last 10 to 15 years. There's massive youth unemployment right now, but in manufacturing, there's 25 million vacant jobs still needing to be filled. There's like a 300,000 talent gap in semiconductors and so many more. It's not just being educated that's important, right? We're pouring so much into education, but it's about the right kind of education, giving them the right kind of skills, the tools to adapt to this new age where AI and you know, supercomputing and all that new tech crop of technology, you need technical workers, you need vocational, vocational workers. And so that is a much more urgent problem than the potential reduction in labor force in so many years. And by the way, China is one of the biggest exports of industrial robots they, uh, if they wanted to substitute robots for the labor force, uh, that is something they can do. So I think before the aging problem, they need to take care of their young people. Uh, actually, as long as we're talking about young people, there's another question here about uh, the educational system. Uh, and this is sort of just, can you talk a little bit about how it works? How, how much of it is state funded? How much of it is individual families? Uh, is higher education available to all? Excellent. Um, so education used to be free, uh, or at least uh, come at a very, very low cost. And, uh, but that all changed after the one-child policy. Why? Because you have only one child, Dragon or Phoenix. You really wanted to invest in that one, one child that you have. And so they started paying huge, exorbitant sums for tutorials outside tutorials. And I can't say, thanks to the capitalist system, um, not a lot, of, a lot of these companies actually exploited that angst from parents. And so uh, it was really exorbitant. Uh, on average, in the data, people spent a quarter of their income on educating one child. So that was really causing all that anxiety uh, in, in the country. And hence, our leaders came in to step in. And again, you know, maybe potentially wreaking havoc in the economy, but it was, it was for social reasons that, uh, that it happened. The education system, I believe, is a challenge. It's a challenge for China's goal of becoming a real innovator, a real kind of um, doing groundbreak in innovation because uh, we, have, we are judged based on standardized testing. But I've been thinking, well, with a country of that many people, you can't have an American system, you know, applications. Think about how much corruption there will be. Uh, and, you know, this is actually the standard test testing is really the only way that the very bottom run of society, those in the poor areas, actually had a chance uh, uh, for a better life. And that's all, and it's not perfect. Um, so I think um, it is a big problem. It is very hard to change. Our last speaker who is here, Kara Swisher, is a tech journalist, and she's talked a little bit about a uh, TikTok ban that's in front of Congress and uh, about some of these social media pieces. Uh, I am just curious, if you were you know, called to testify and talk about what the, whether the US should be concerned about something like TikTok or social media ownership by a Chinese company or whether that's overblown, just what would you say? Wow. <laughs> Geez, tough questions, by the way. <laughs> I wasn't. I, I got a really warm welcome yesterday, so I, I need to <laughs> answer We're some very of these, glad you're here. these uh. questions. I guess. Um, you know, data is becoming a national security concern all around the world, and and so I, I understand that. But at the same time, from what I know, and I don't know that much. TikTok has done everything it can in terms of having Oracle manage some of its data and putting the data and keeping in the US. I don't know if there's more uh, that can be done. Um, but look, you know, this is America, right? It's not China. Why does America want to look more and more like China? And so, you know, the kind of principles we uphold in this economy, the free markets, I understand they're national security issues, but uh, it's also really difficult to compare what would happen uh, between the two, two countries. You know, Tesla also, some people are saying EVs are of national security concerns because of the data, right? I don't think we should not 
we should ban Tesla. That would be a huge you know, disappointment for Chinese people, and I don't think we're going to do that. Um, so I, I do think, though, that more and more countries are going to use this national security as an excuse to do lots of protectionist things. We just got to keep it really pretty narrow. Otherwise, it's going to spread out throughout um, all kinds of goods, and then this can kind of go out of hand. So we've talked about a lot of things, uh, geopolitics, a lot of big economics things, uh, things that are in front of Congress and different governments around the world. And I can imagine people being like, this is all very interesting, but like, what do I do with this? And so I am curious, maybe just as a, a way to end, if, if you would have anything that you would want people to take home or an invitation for what sort of folks who are just watching today, listening uh, or on the radio later, uh, that you would want them to sort of take from what you're talking about in the book or talked about here today that you think would move us in a positive direction. Mm, thank you. Well, I think, you know, let's keep our communications channel open. People-to-people um, -people connection, business-to-business, -business, but also at the leadership level, the military level, how important is that, right? Leaders not talking twice a year, I mean, maybe once a month would, would help. And um, I don't know, keeping, you know, there are lots of Chinese students who really still want to come here and lots of universities that want to work together, lots of scientists, data scientists, AI scientists that still want to see the collaboration. So I think that to the extent that we can, to keep those exchanges uh, uh, open, that would be great. And recently, uh, Anthony Blinken mentioned about, I remember you know, sitting in this meeting and I'm pretty surprised to say that he said something positive about China and said, uh, talked about the fentanyl, fentanyl uh, crisis in this country and how China really did, uh, the Chinese government really took action and seriously implemented all these, you know, um, uh, 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 restrictions or, or uh, cutting down in China, and that is an instance of collaboration. And so that might be a small victory. That might be a small victory, but I think it would help build trust over time, little by little. So. On that note, can you all please help me do a big, warm thank you, thank thank you, you. Thank you. Dr. Kei Jin, for speaking here at the Westminster Town Hall Forum. Again, the book is the New China Playbook Beyond Socialism and Capitalism. Thank you so much, Thank Dr. Kei Yu Jin. So she will be outside signing books after this. Thank you all so much for being here at the Westminster Town Hall Forum. Uh, please join us for our reception. Join us for our post-forum discussion. Uh, get a copy of the book. It's really good. Uh, and we will see you again at the Westminster Town Hall Forum. Thank you so Thank much. You. I hope I wasn't too hard on you.